In this video, we're going to take a look at the second race condition lab on Port Swigger's Web Security Academy. The lab is called Bypassing Rate Limits via Race Conditions. All right, so just to provide a quick recap of the first video where we looked at limit overrun race conditions. In that example, we had a lab where there was a voucher discount that we were able to apply to our order. And this is how the flow would look. So you would submit the code, it'll check if the code has been used, and if not, it'll apply the discount and then set that code already used boolean to be true. And this means if you subsequently try to use the code again, it'll again check has the code been used, and this time it will return true, meaning that you can't reuse the code, you'll just get an invalid message. However, what if the requests happen at the same time? So you have two requests here, they both submit the discount code, and in both cases it comes back to say that the code hasn't been used because that value is currently false in the database. Therefore, it applies a discount on both requests, and then it updates the code to be already used. So this is a race window. This basically means that there could be multiple discounts applied in between the code first being checked if it's been used and the code being updated to say it has been used. In this case, we have two requests, but obviously this could be more. And in the lab that we looked at previously, we sent 20 requests at the same time in order to get the item almost for free. So today's lab is going to focus on detecting and exploiting limit overrun race conditions with Turbo Intruder. In addition to providing native support for a single packet attack in Burp Repeater, Ortswigger has also enhanced the Turbo Intruder extension to support this technique. And we can download the latest version of that from the Burp App Store. Turbo Intruder requires proficiency in Python, but is suited to more complex attacks such as ones that require multiple retries, daggered request timing, or an extremely large number of requests. To use a single packet attack in Turbo Intruder, we can follow these four steps. First is to ensure that the target supports HTTP2 as the single packet attack is incompatible with HTTP1. Second, we need to set the engine to equal engine.burp2 and the concurrent connections to one in the configuration options. Thirdly, when queuing the requests, we need to group them by assigning them to a named gate using the gate argument for the engine.queue method. And finally, to send all of the requests in a given group, we need to open the respective gate with the engine.openGate method. And here we have an example of that. So you can see we've got this function, queue request, which takes a target and word lists, and then we set the engine, configuring the options as advised. So we need concurrent connections to equal one, and we need the engine to be engine dot burp2. And then in this case, we are queuing 20 requests for gate one, and then eventually we're going to open that gate. For more details, we can see the race single packet attack.py template, which is provided in Turbo Intruder's default examples directory. So that brings us on to the practical lab, bypassing rate limits via race conditions. The description says, this lab's login mechanism uses rate limiting to defend against brute force attacks. However, this can be bypassed due to a race condition. To solve the lab, we need to work out how to exploit the race condition to bypass the rate limit, successfully brute force a password for the user Carlos, log in and access the admin panel, and then delete the user Carlos. As usual, we're given some credentials that we can log in with, and this time we've also been given a list of potential passwords. I didn't actually see this whenever I solved the lab, so you can also just use a common password list. And then there's a note which says that we need to use Burp September 2023 or higher, and we should use the latest version of Turbo Intruder from the Burp App Store. We also have a time limit of 15 minutes, so if we don't solve the lab within that time, we need to reset it. But Carlos's password will change each time. All right, so we get through to the lab. We've only got 15 minutes, and if we get down to like three or four minutes, then we don't really have much time to test out our attacks. So let's try and move kind of quickly. I'm going to start with the user that we have the credentials for because I don't want to lock out the user that we're targeting. And I'm just going to put in some incorrect credentials. I guess I could have just used a shorter password. Let's do that twice and a third time and a fourth time. I noticed then that after three login attempts, we were locked out for one minute. I believe this also increments. So next time we get locked out, we'll be locked out for two minutes. So that's the general process here. And now we want to go and see what happens whenever we use the burp repeater. So we want to let this reset, actually. Let me wait for one minute, but I'll also send this to repeater. We'll get this ready. And we can do a group, first of all. Add to a group, I'll call it race. 
And then I'll do Control and R to create, we'll go with about 20 tabs again. Okay, so I waited for over a minute, so we are now clear to try this again. And this is the probe stage where we would normally try and find out what happens when we send this in a sequence of separate connections. And if I click that, it's basically going to send each one of these 20 requests, one after another, using separate connections. I'm not going to do that because what we're going to see is what we just saw when we did this manually, namely that the first three requests will come back and say incorrect password. And then every request after that will come back to say that we've had too many login attempts and we need to wait this period of time. So I'm not going to do that. But this is how you would generally approach these. You would go and find some kind of functionality. You see how it behaves whenever you send multiple requests as separate connections in a sequence. And then you'll do the exact same thing again, but you'll send them in parallel and see how it responds differently. I'm just going to jump straight to that stage because we did already do the manual lockout. And then we just go through each one of these responses and see what we've got. So we can see with the first one, we have invalid username or password. We can actually do a search here as well, although it's kind of annoying that it resets each time. So there's our first three, all invalid as you would expect. Now, based on what we saw when we sent these requests one after another, we would also expect this to be, oh sorry, we would expect this one to be a lockout, but it's also invalid. And if we go on to the sixth one, that's also invalid. And if we go on to the seventh one, and I think you're getting the idea, we can go to, let's go to the 20th tab, and it also has invalid username or password, which means even though the lockout will have occurred, in fact, if we go here and just try an incorrect credential, okay, I think the time might have reset since I did that, but it, it will still lock us out. It just means that the 20 attempts that we already sent were all successfully returned. So we were able to find out whether those 20 passwords that we tried were valid, even though we should be locked out after three attempts. So the next thing we'll do is send this through to the Turbo Intruder. So we can just take one of these requests and I'll go to extensions and then I don't actually have Turbo Intruder. So just make sure that you have the extension installed and activated. I'm gonna activate it now. Activated without issues. So let's go back to our repeater or you can go into proxy, just wherever you can find this request and then we can send it to the Turbo Intruder. And this opens up. I can't actually increase the text size here. It's just that whatever's used for burp overall. But essentially we have our request at the top and we want to say what we want to update here. So in this case, we're going to be looping through passwords. So I'm going to put the percentage S there to denote that's the value we want to be replaced with each of the words in the word list. And here we have the script. So I'm going to change this to the single packet attack that we saw in the port swigger notes. And notice then that the concurrent connections are set to one and we've got this burp2 engine being used. That was one of the requirements. And we also have this gate. So essentially we're queuing 20 requests into this gate. And then at the end, we're gonna open a gate so they all get sent at once. Now we need to provide the word list that we're gonna use. So I'm gonna go back to our lab and grab these passwords. Actually, the first time that I solved this, I just used a word list of 200 passwords. And it worked first time, but that isn't guaranteed and I don't want to waste too much time in the video. So I'll talk about this at the end. But for now, I've copied those into the clipboard. And actually, what we can just do is say that our words are equal to, in fact, what I'll do is do for I in, and instead of range, we'll say wordless.clipboard. And this, I'll change this to word. So for word in our word list, let us queue a request and then you want to supply the word there as well in the queue and I believe that should be it we can also use this handle response I'll talk about that at the end so that we don't waste too much time for now change this to Carlos and we'll try and do the attack the engine is warming up apparently and there we go so it sends off all the requests at once we get back all the responses at the same time and we want to basically go through and have a look at the status of these or it could be you look for some keywords so Maybe we look for that invalid message and then we look for one that doesn't have it or we look for one that has successfully logged in or something like that. But in this case, we actually see there's only one request that has a 302. That's 302 found. It's because it's successfully logged us in and it's redirecting us to our account. And that means we found the password. So the password is QWERTY UIOP. So I'm going to take a copy of that and I'm going to go back to our lab. We might still be locked out, but let's try it. Okay, invalid. CSRF token, let's try it again. Yeah, too many incorrect attempts, but it's gonna reset in five seconds. 
And there we go, we log in, and now we can go and delete our account. Uh, where is it? Admin panel, delete the user Carlos, and there we go, we've solved the lab. I've just moved over to the Integrity blog as well. We did a post a while back on how to use Turbo Intruder, and it talks a little bit about some of the configs. So we just mentioned there that we can't change our concurrent connections, but just in case you haven't used Turbo Intruder before, you want to learn a bit more about it, if you were just doing some standard brute forcing, Assuming you don't have the Pro Burp Suite that has an unthrottled intruder, you probably want to use this Turbo Intruder because it's free and you can just write a Python script yourself. But by default, it will only give us eight requests per second. However, by changing the concurrent connections to 25, we get a 400% speed increase, although we can't do that for this single packet attack. And if we want to go even faster than that, we can also increase the request per connection. So if we change that to 100, we'll get another 2,000% increase in speed. And we can also use pipelining, which will double our speed once again. So just worth bearing in mind, just in case you want to use this more often in general for web pen testing or bug bounty. And if you want to learn even more about Turbo Intruder, you can check out this article. It's quite a few years old now from James Kettle, but it talks a lot about how you can configure it how it works and some of the cool features. Something that we didn't yet show is this handle response option. Let me see. So here's an example of trim boring results. So in our case, you'll notice that it added every response to this table. But what we could have said here is actually, we only want to add responses if they are a 302. And that means that only the ones that have that successful login attempt. And you might think, how do we know it's going to be a 302? Well, we just go and log in with the account we have the credentials for first and see how it behaves. Does it come back with a different response code? Does it have something different in the response, some text or something like that? So if this just came back with a 200 OK, but it had a string in it saying successfully logged in, then we would just update this accordingly. And we can also filter on other attributes. So you can see here, we can say we basically only want to match responses that have a 200 or a 204 response code. And we can say that we only want to match responses that are within this range of sizes. So that's important because if you're doing this with a very big word list, a lot of requests, then every one of those is going to be added to the table and it will eat up your RAM. So by filtering out responses that we're not interested in, you can basically help with the performance. It also mentions that it's a good idea to loop through the words line by line rather than reading the whole word list and then looping through those words for the same reason it's going to eat into your RAM. There's probably a lot of other cool things in this article which I've forgotten about but you can check this out in your own time. Let me just show one final thing if we go back to our Turbo Intruder. So in this case we use the clipboard but what if we want to test a lot of passwords? Well we might want to open up the word list here. So we could say like, if we want to open up rock U, there we go, we provide the file path. The problem is rock U, as you may know, has millions of passwords in it. So if we do this, essentially what we're doing is we're queuing those millions of passwords into requests, and then we're gonna open up the gate and send them all at once. Now, if we send more than 20 or 30 passwords at once in a single packet attack, the others aren't going to get through. So in other words, the first 20 or 30 will come back and say invalid password or correct password. But all of the requests after that will come back and say that you've been locked out of your account, which means we would need to do all of those millions of passwords again. So it makes no sense to send them all at once. In this case, we might use a subscript. So we could say, let's just do 0 to 20 or 0 to 30 on the first attempt. But to do that, we also need to use that read lines, which it did advise us not to do. But that'll basically get around to that. So we could give this a go. I've actually relaunched the lab, which is still running. So if we go to our account and do Carlos, and then let's just go and grab that request. Take a copy of it, go back to our Turbo Intruder, set this to percentage S again, and then we'll click attack. And there we go. So we get back the 30 responses. Notice that some of them are 3654, and that response size indicates that we've got too many incorrect attempts. So if we filter it by that, we'll see that actually, I think around 10 of those failed to be tested. So it means we basically, yeah, we only got zero to 20. And then after that, the next 10 weren't tested, which means we'd have to go back and then do from 20 to 40. Oh, the other thing to mention 
was the handle response. So at the moment, this is set to, it takes in a request and interest in. And actually, this was in the article as well. I forgot about that. So the interest in, apparently, it takes like a baseline based on what responses look like so that if you're getting a lot of responses with the same parameters, it will stop adding those to the response table, I believe. But you can specify something manually here. So we could say only add it to the table if the request.status code is equal to 302, because we know that's what we're looking for. That's a successful login. So we could do that. Let me see whether our time has reset. We've got 25 seconds left. Okay, that should be the lockout reset. Let's go and try this. We'll click attack, and now we're doing the next 20 passwords, but we're only adding them to the list if we get the... Okay, we've got 20 fails. It didn't add them to the list because none of them were 302. So that's basically how we can do this anyway. If we were to change this, we could say if the request.response, and then we could say contains. So we could say if um, successful, in request.response, then we want you to add it to the table, or we could do the opposite of that. Anyway, to summarize, we have looked at how we can bypass rate limits via race conditions, and specifically how we can brute force the credentials of users. Unfortunately, brute forcing of user passwords or even username enumeration is typically out of scope for bug bounty, so it's not going to help you too much there. But hopefully this education that we're getting into how race conditions work and how we can exploit them will help us in some other areas. As usual, I'll just take the final few seconds to recommend that you sign up to the Integrity Bug Bounty platform and try and find some of these race condition vulnerabilities on real applications and get paid for it. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks. Bye -bye.